Hey folks, um, my name is Vasily Shapovalov, I work in uh, Lido and what I want to talk about today is what I think will be the future of liquid staking. Um, really love the crowd by the way, there's so many of you. Um, a bit about uh, us and about me, why I'm talking about this, I'm uh, a tech lead at Lido, which is a DAO that's headquartered on Vium that uh, makes uh, liquid staking protocols and it maintains the largest liquid staking protocol in existence, Lido on Ethereum, um, which has uh, uh, a bit more than 4 million ever in it. Mm, currently the number two DeFi protocol by TVL and uh, I'm co-founder tech lead, so uh, I guess I know a couple of things about staking, so. Um, um, uh, for uh, folks who are not really familiar with the topic, liquid staking is when a staker gets a transferable voucher when they lock up their stake in a staking protocol. So, like, uh, it's not, uh, it, it can be used in DeFi, it can be transferred, sold, bought, uh, collateralized, etc., etc. Um, and uh, a liquid staking is uh, a small but growing and pretty significant in size uh, uh, part of staking economy, you know, like, like all the staking economy without 80 billions and liquid staking protocols that together uh, are about 8 billions or so. And if we add uh, to the liquid staking protocols also liquid staking on exchanges, which I think we uh, actually should. Uh, count am among the liquid staking options, uh, it will be closer to 20 billion, I think. So uh, large, but not overwhelming part of the staking economy. Um, so um, I'm going to, like, I'm not going to do any deep insights here. Like, I am uh, don't pretend there is something I'm going to say that is not pretty obvious, I think. Uh, but uh, I'm going to say it anyway. Uh, I'm going to make three predictions. Basically, one is that like protocol-based liquid staking will grow alongside DeFi ecosystem. Uh, when DeFi ecosystem grows, liquid staking uh, protocols grow with it. When it doesn't grow, when it stagnates, that like liquid staking will not uh, protocols will not grow. Like there will be uh, people will use uh, staking exchanges instead. Um, there will be a lot of options for liquid staking, but few of them will be winners. And uh, the like, who will be the winner? Who will be the winners? Uh, will be determined by stakers. They they will be the the one with who vote with their money about like what the future would look like. Um, now, uh, in a bit of more details, area of this uh, statement, I'll uh, talk about it. So, our experience at Lido building liquid. Staking protocols, many chains. We have like one on Ethereum, one on uh, Solana, on uh, um, uh, Polygon, on uh, um, uh, Polkadot. The thing is, liquid staking pro uh, protocol growth is driven by DeFi ecosystem growth. Whether when there is a low amount of DeFi penetration, liquid staking will also be pretty, pretty small. And when there is like a very strong economy, like on Ethereum, liquid staking will be will be very popular. There are other factors, but like that's primarily uh, the thing. Like when people want to use the other in DeFi, they will rather use some kind of staking, uh, staking liquid staking token in DeFi. Uh, when they don't use, uh, want to use other in DeFi, they don't care about stake the other, rocket pool other, etc., etc. So. Um, and the main competition are the wallet gardens of CeFi, uh, like exchanges have liquid staking since forever. Uh, it works very seamlessly. It's very uh, very easy for the user. They like just deposit the uh, tokens that they used to, used to if they are working with exchange and it's automatically staked. It can be often used as collateral for margin trading. Like it has most of the users that people want liquid staking for. And if you don't care about being in decentralized finance, uh, if you don't care about like these being not your keys, uh, it's perfectly serviceable. So, um, 
and the product is just better than regular staking. The um, liquid staking is better for users than regular staking. The adoption barriers that like a major problem for liquid staking protocol growth is smart contract risk, governance risks, and sometimes tax implications. Um, the smart contract risk and governance risk, on one hand, they go down uh, with time. So like with time, people start starting to trust more the protocols for good measure uh, because they haven't been hacked. They are like less likely to be hacked in the future. Uh, same about governance. And uh, still, uh, it's not worth it. Like if you're not using to use the token in DeFi, like if you if you're not not using to uh, not going to trade it or collateralize it, you don't want to take this additional risk. Um, and uh, there are like a mul multiple options for building liquid staking protocols uh, and like liquid staking in general, not just protocols that are um, uh, going like exist to, uh, already or will be existing going forward, and. Uh, um, to talk about them, we need to understand what is liquid staking as a product, like who are the users, what do they want. And there are three kinds of users, like three kinds of stakeholders for liquid staking. One is the stakers, they are most important here. And they want staking rewards, they want security, they want liquidity and usability in, uh, in finance, basically. Um, protocols community want the best validator set for the protocol that is decentralized, censorship resistant. And node operators in protocols, they uh, want to run a stable staking business if they are professional. And if they're hobbyists, they want to be like, I don't know, respected. Uh, they, they are not rational. They uh, just do it for the fun and for the feeling of uh, uh, contribu contributing to decentralization, which is great. So, um, and the options that are available or will be available in the future are broadly, um, it's custodial option, uh, exchange-based liquid staking or custody-based liquid staking. Uh, it's protocol that are based on risk management. It's protocol that are based on uh, bonds for security. Um, they're hyper-compliant protocols and marketplace types uh, type protocols. Um, so, custod yeah, I, I'm listing them in the order of adoption. Custodial liquid staking, like exchange liquid staking, is uh, like the largest one. Uh, if you combine, like even on Ethereum, but if you combine together all the uh, exchange staking options, it's like a, 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 lot, a lot of uh, market share. Mm, they um, are exchange or custody based, very simple to use for users because like centralized solutions are like very good for you for user experience. Usually, you can do a lot uh, to make it simpler. Uh, they have uh, no additional risk if you already trust the exchange in question with the, with the capital. Um, often have included uh, the options for margin trading, lending, uh, money markets, etc. Um, and because the uh, operator of uh, custodial liquid staking, like exchange or something, they are double dipping, so they they are getting staking rewards and like fee on staking rewards, and they are also get, getting a fee on trading on maybe custody fees or something like that. Um, they can offer very competitive rates compared to, to other. Like the, 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 this option will likely win on profitability going forward. It's not the case right now because like Coinbase takes a lot of, um, a lot of fees, but they have much more uh, uh, options to go lower on fees because they can double dip in the vertical integrations. Um, they have usually super valid data sets, so like they don't provide a, like that much value for the, like as much value as they could for the protocol, uh, because they select few operators um, uh, with little diversity in uh, jurisdictions, physical locations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and it's not transparent, and they are susceptible to regulatory capture because like CFI solution are like extremely regulated. Um, Risk management based protocols, they are non custodial. They manage slash and risks protocol wide by creating credit value data sets that like minimize slash and risks. Um, they, therefore, they are usually capital efficient, so they're easy to grow, they're easy to, uh, to accept stake. Um, and uh, for like 
uh, for the um, competitive advantage on the user side, they rely on DeFi ecosystem. So like when DeFi ecosystem is better than uh, any any single wallet garden of, of exchange, they can uh, offer a good uh, that, uh, alternative to centralized exchanges. Uh, valid data set they have are like very different in in, uh, in design because uh, and in quality they can be big they can be small they can be like consist of one uh, operator which is like uh, the same the protocol operators basically um, and uh, they um, um, that, that's because like the managed protocol set is uh, the valid data set is basically the major part of the product here uh, and that's where they differ very much. Um, it can be good, it can be bad, it like depends on the protocol. Uh, bonded protocol are also non-custodial, they manage slash and risk by requiring validator bonds. Uh, that makes them capital inefficient because validators, like the good validators, like the uh, not operators community, they don't usually have a lot of money. And when they are required to provide bonds, they, this is limited by basically the amount of capital of operators or the amount of debt they are willing to take from outside sources. Um, and uh, uh, the valid data set management is left to the market. Like basically if you have capital, uh, you can participate as an uh, operator, you can provide your own validation, and that's the only thing that is required. Which I think at scale delivers centralized valid data sets because Capital is centralized. Uh, like if you take a look at uh, Geni coefficient of Ethereum, for example, which is like one of the best ones, it's it's really high. Like most of the whales are walled by like few dozens of whales. Um, at when the protocol is at scale, that they are either providing a loan or they are operating cells at, at scale and uh, take the majority of the validator set. Um, this option of hyper compliant one is not um, um, very different in tech side from risk management. Uh, it's a different approach because like it's a uh, selling point and main feature is that the valid data set is uh, extensively KIC and uh, um, certif uh, certified and uh, um, regulated. And they are likely to not deliver valid data sets that uh, the protocol community want. Um, and uh, I don't think there will be much liquid or usable because like usability in DeFi requires, uh, like they, they, they make clients are people who uh, are like very scary of regulations. I think that's like selling through lawyers uh, type of things um, uh, that are averse to participate in, in much of the DeFi. So. And the last type is marketplace, is when there is there are multiple options for staking in one place, uh, different risk profiles, features, and costs. Uh, and when they do a liquid staking token, they have to fund it uh, in some way, like uh, risk, either they do risk management on options, like to, to, uh, to, to make a fungible basket of uh, different uh, options in the marketplace, or uh, do the bond type, or just do a naive, like assuming every, every risk profile is the same. Um, current state on Ethereum is that risk management uh, is the largest uh, protocol, like it's LIDO, it's risk management type. Uh, the second by size is custodial, uh, but it will very quickly jump to one by one when withdrawals are possible and every other on every any exchange can be staked more safely than right now. Uh, and the third uh, type is bonded, it's rocket pool, it's the third, uh, third position. Uh, and by growth speed right now, uh, Coinbase uh, liquid staking token grows the fastest. Um, Lido has the second place and uh, uh, rocket pool is the third. So uh, this is the current trend. Um, I think that the only non-custodial trust minimized options can be designed with the can't do evil principle in mind. So uh, uh, liquid staking protocols that uh, are su sufficiently limited uh, in what they can do to like to stake to validate a set selection to uh, um, 
uh, to force uh, or like uh, entice operators to operate in a certain way when they are limited in that, uh, they can be entirely harmless for the protocol and not a threat. Uh, custodial solutions can't do that because like they can act uh, like with the values, but uh, um, they are extremely susceptible to uh, to regulations, which can be not aligned with uh, company's value. Um, I think that only risk management based protocols can deliver a good value data set at scale because at scale the like the main thing that you deliver for a protocol is a good value data set and uh, if you don't have an opinionated uh, uh, selection algorithm that says that like the good value data set should be defined like should be diverse should be diverse in jurisdiction in um, uh, uh, sh sh should be pretty flat in distribution of stake, should be uh, diverse geographically and like uh, um, uh, in, in, in cloud and uh, on-premise operations, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, uh, that's, uh, that's essentially what like risk management is. You manage the risk for the protocol as well. Um, so I think there are two possible outcomes for the future of Ethereum. Is one is that like most of the stake is in the risk management protocol that provides a good quality set. Um, minority is in its custodial and bonded is like the uh, on the third place. And the better outcome is vice versa when most of the stake is custodial and uh, the rest is in protocols. Um, um, so uh, anyway, whatever I think on that, uh, it, it doesn't matter much because I am not the one who decides who will win and like who who will lose and like what will be the base uh, the, the 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 largest options. It's the stakers who decide the outcome. Uh, like not not operators, uh, they are agents. Uh, they operate like either very small amounts of their own stake or like large amounts of other people's money. They do not decide like who, who is going to be the winner. It's not stake aggregators like protocols or custodies because users, stakers actually decide which, uh, which aggregator to use. Uh, it's not protocol researchers or developers because they design like a neutral protocol that can be used by other people which are stakers to, uh, to have the desired outcome. It's not uh, voices on crypto to create a Twitter or like protocol governance, it's it's going to be the stakers. Uh, current state of Ethereum staking is the direct result of stakers making the choice in the past. Like they, why is Lido big? Because people staked with Lido. Why is like uh, Coinbase big? Because people decide to stake with Coinbase. Uh, the future will be a result of stakers making the decision going forward. So what I'm asking you folks uh, is to select the best best stake based on your ethos, your needs, your capabilities. Like if you can, if you want and you can run your own node, run your own node. Uh, if you see a good uh, option for staking with the protocol, like stick with the protocol or with the node operator you trust or something like that. Um, because like stakers will be uh, deciding the future of uh, uh, value data set on Ethereum, like how the uh, Ethereum will be operating in the future. Um, as a bonus thing, I uh, like I, I made a few predictions, but there are a few cur curveballs that can invalidate all of that, uh, very like very unexpectedly. Um, one thing that like is obviously can be can change the capital very much is uh, regulations uh, like regulators can force most of Ethereum uh, stakers and most of like a lot of Ethereum is like in regulated uh, jurisdictions uh, a lot of Ether is uh, um, uh, holders are in regulated jurisdictions to uh, comply to local regs and if local regs say them to stake in a specific way they will likely comply. Uh, the funds, the like the custodies, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, they uh, will have to. Um, the second curveball is uh, um, risk taking. Uh, shout out to Angular. Um, it's basically using the same stake on multiple protocols. Uh, um, the the main idea is like you can stake either in. Uh, 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 in the Ethereum protocol, and then can use the voucher to the stake state, uh, like stake to the token or like a, a risk token or something, uh, as a stake in a different protocol. 
uh, that does something different and it's subject to um, to additional slashings if something goes wrong. Uh, that leads to a combinatorial explosion in potential risk and rewards profiles. So right now it's pretty easily uh, it's pretty easy to fudge the unfungible the staking positions. Like you uh, manage the risk and rewards and like you get can get liquid token out of it, like or make it bonded or something. Uh, when there is a lot of options for getting additional rewards for taking additional risks, which is going to happen if Angular takes off, uh, that makes uh, the the space very very diverse and for possibilities uh, of using your other in different ways, and it's become be becoming much harder to fudge than fungible. Um, and it makes uh, ma ma risk management based protocol harder to design and marketplaces uh, more uh, more suitable to the to the state and there is um, a lot of differentiation in different options for staking marketplaces are better suited to that than uh, risk management and uh, the elephant of the room in the room is a second order effects of MEV uh, because like that's a very uh, it's filled with emergent rules. Uh, we like we don't understand how it works until it works in a specific way. Usually, we can predict some things, but not all things. Uh, and it's hard to see the future clearly. And it clearly has uh, a lot of requirement for latency and uh, benefits a lot from exclusivity deals, which can force centralization somewhere in some place. And uh, it can happen that it will force centralization like on protocol management, like on, pro on stake management level or like on staking layer or um, like wherever we, we don't know yet. Like at least I don't know. I'm, uh, I, 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 don't, I don't quite understand how it will end up. And I think that we, we will see it when we'll see it, not, not before. Um, I think the best way to counter that on staking level will be to transform validators and protocol to dumb pipes that don't make any decisions basically or make as as like uh, uh, can opt out of making decisions at least uh, something like PBS uh, design with CR lists for example um, um, but like as I said it's curveball I I'm not completely sure with how it's going to play out um, so that's it. Thank you for coming. I like. I'm really hyped with seeing such like, such such a good crowd. Hello, sorry. Uh, you mentioned in Lido of the risk management reference of LSDs. How is this related to the insurance of Lido in relation to the TBL? Mm, I don't quite get the question. Uh, I'm going to answer as best as I can. So. Uh, Lido is a protocol that uh, uh, takes uh, stakers ever and it distributed to a validator set in a specific way. This validator set is selected in a way to de risk the um, staked other holders, so like reduce slashing risks, and to make the validator set of Ethereum better as well. So, like, we try to distribute in a way that will be. Uh, or increase the diversity of uh, validators and like the stake distribution, uh, make better stake distribution. Uh, we don't require operators to bond uh, the capital to um, to operate, and that makes uh, scaling for Lido really easy uh, because all the operators need to do is to upload some more keys into Lido and like accept more stake. Uh, and uh, that's why when there was a lot of demand for staking uh, in uh, in the ecosystem, it went to Lido and not say to Coinbase. Uh, when the growth is limited by uh, by not operators having enough capital uh, or having enough uh, like cheap uh, loans options or something like that, uh, it's not like it's not being able to uh, to ride these waves of like staking demands. Uh, so I guess like the TVL of Lido is uh, direct uh, results of the design. Okay, I was wondering, um, like one of the curveballs that maybe could happen is what if it becomes dramatically easier to operate nodes? Like it's pretty complex to like spin up your own like beacon currently. But what if it was much much easier? How would that impact um, the overall market? In your opinion. Um, so I think that um, it's not going to become dramatically easy for a long time. Uh, 
the reason is like before protocol classification, it's really hard to maintain the the nodes in like in a good state because there are a lot of grades and uh, like hot fixes and stuff. Um, but imagine it it is becoming dramatically easier. Then um, on like on liquid staking, I think it will result will be that there will be more solo operators in it. Like every protocol, like every protocol will uh, that that will be big enough will converge on like on some hybrid model of having most of the stake in risk management and less stake in bonded solution for permissionless operators uh, just to promote the uh, solo stakers. And um, the removing of barriers will lead to more solo stakers and like a bit more importance for uh, to, to having this feature. Uh, that's my guess. Hello, Vasily. It's really nice to meet you. I have two questions, Why? actually. First, first one, I would like to understand what do you see as the biggest risk for the liquid staking industry or the staking industry as a whole right now? And second one, what do you see as the biggest risk for Lido right now? Um, I think the answer to both is smart contract risk. Uh, like. DeFi protocols are, are like very robust. I think it's the most like the most bugs free for code in the world. Like right now, like better than aerospace, better than medical code, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but it's like existing in a very toxic environment where any like any mistakes gets exploited like very fast. Um, so smart contract risk is probably the, the like the the major risk. And uh, on the more like economical side, I think. Uh, uh, like I'm really um, thinking that uh, exchanges, wallet guard, like Cefi, are really a, like a very strong competitor to uh, protocol-based liquid staking because centralization is uh, more like it's cheaper and people care a lot about APR. So, so uh, I have some statistics um, on the Lido token emission. It's kind of like outdated, but it's um something to minimize. So the token incentives that the emissions in the last seven days is five million in terms of TVL, while the revenues is only 600K. Do you think it's that people actually value the governance of Lido itself as a, a liquid sticker, or it's kind of like being overvalued? Do you see any attack factors or governance if it, it revert to like it's, it, it kind of like go down if people don't value it as much as it's right now? Um. Uh, let, let, let me rephrase and say if I understood it right. So you're saying that uh, we have a lot of incentives and uh, LIDOS TVL is probably because of incentives and not because of like people, because of the fact that people want it, right? Okay, why the um, token incentive is 5 million? Uh, so the incentives are not that big in, uh, uh, in the overall uh, protocol, um, uh, like compared to overall protocol revenue, and they are needed to maintain a, a good li liquid um, uh, pools for liquidations to happen. Um, that's the only reason they exist. Uh, the staking rewards are the main uh, reason people pe people have staked it. There is like uh, of over like four million of feather in Lido. I think about. Uh, between 200,000 and 600,000 of stake tether is locked in uh, maybe 700, I don't know, is locked in, 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 in into incentivized pools. Uh, so I think that when withdrawals are, like, are in, uh, that will be completely unnecessary and uh, will change everything. Like uh, the incentives will be slow, but the protocol will be just as useful.